our study, we're in a special study called the New Covenant Theology of the Blood of Christ. Uh, the larger series that we're in is called The Healthy Church. But I stopped and did a mini-series because we do the Eucharist every month, and I'm not sure that we fully understand the importance of the cup. Because it says, as often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. When he's talking about the new covenant cup of the blood of Christ, what the word remembrance about the cup is, is what that cup, the blood of Christ, accomplished for us to be able to have the Eucharist. And so we've been talking about the nine factors of communion with God through the blood of Christ. For example, in John 14, 6, Jesus says something that's generic. In other words, it has a general meaning to it. You have to really study to understand the impact it would have. But in John 14, 6, Jesus said that uh, he is the way, the truth, and the life, and no man can come to the Father except through him. That's a very generic idea, a general idea, isn't it? I mean, there's a lot of information you've got to have to know what that means. Well, one of the things it means <clears throat> in detail is that Christ came into the world to die on a cross for our sins, to be buried and raised from the dead third day. <clears throat> that crucifixion or the cross of Christ, the crucifixion of Christ, is where the theology of the new, new covenant theology of the blood comes from. What is this blood about? Well, it, it's rooted in shadow Christology, animal sacrifice, but it's the theology of the animal sacrifice, not the literal sacrifice of an animal. It's the theology connected to it that said when Christ would come, they, the old covenant looked for the coming of Christ, when he would come, that he would, he would fulfill the theology of the animal blood. The life is in the blood business. Now, what we're talking about is spiritual because man has fallen not because he sins. Man has fallen because Adam sinned. And I know that when I heard that as an unbeliever, I went, what? But in Romans, the fifth chapter in verse 12, it says, Wherefore, by one man, Adam, sin entered to the world and death through sin. And so death passed on to all men. Where do you get that from, Ron? Well, where did Paul get it from? <laughs> I got it from Paul. So where did Paul get it from? Listen to me. He got it from Genesis 2.17. See, I'm talking about the theology of the blood of Christ. Where did he get this? That through one man's sin in the world and death by sin, and so it spread to all mankind. Now, we know that death spread to all mankind. Would you not agree? We would go to funerals all the day. There's a whole business out there called funerals. Where did that come from? How did that become a norm and standard of the human race? Is that not a fair question? Now, that was a really important question to me as an unbeliever who did not believe in God himself. Where does that idea come from? From the scriptures, it says, Genesis 2.17, God told Adam, don't eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, for in the day you eat of it, dying, you will die. Now, we know that that's not a, just a physical death because Adam, the day he sinned, <clears throat> death was to occur, and he lived 930 years later. He died 930 years later. Yet, God is true to his word, so something died because God said the day you eat, the day, the day you eat. And in the Hebrew, he said, dying you will die. So some death, some kind of death took place 930 years before he actually died physically. What was that? That was spiritual death. Spiritual death always precedes physical death. 
we're born, and that was Adam's sin. It was Adam's sin that, was sp- that spread death, sin and death, spread it, spread it, spread it like a, a bad disease, spread it to all mankind. We're all infected by it. We're all infected, not affected, infected by it. So when we come to the New Covenant theology, we have an enormous history of theology behind the blood of Christ, is my point. Now listen to me. It is amazing to me that the church, who should know this, doesn't teach it. I sat in a church where two pastors got up and spoke. And they presented a wonderful message on salvation. On why you needed to be saved. Both men presented a wonderful message on why you needed to be saved. Neither of them told you how. That's like going to the doctor with an incurable disease and he tells you you have an incurable disease or a curable disease, I should say, and have a curable disease, then don't tell you how to cure it. Has a curable disease. You have a disease that's make you sick. You go to him, he says, you have a curable disease, but never tells you how to do it. How bad is that? Some people say, Ron, you nitpick. That's not nitpicking. That's what put Christ on the cross. It wasn't the need for salvation. It was the cure of it. It was the cure. It was the cure. So the theology of the blood of Christ is enormous theology Enormous theology. That's why pastors should spend their whole life studying it. Because we have the answer. We have the cure. We need to give it. We need to make sure that when we present the problem, we present the solution. We'll try to do that today as we look at the New Covenant theology. I don't know. Is your sinuses bothering you too? Will Will we ever get out of it? I had a week of relief, and now I'm right back in it. Two days back into Birmingham, and I'm right back where I was <coughs> a week ago. <coughs> so let me, I know I wish you had a cup of coffee too, but I have to sip on it or I'll never get through. So let's have a word of prayer. I want to talk about grace. <coughs> I want to talk about grace, peace. I want to talk about the peace we have that comes by the grace of God. You don't earn it. You don't deserve it, but you can have it. Listen, we're in the mo- we live in one of the most anxious societies. <clears throat> when I was studying, uh, going through my theology training, I went ahead and picked up a degree in psychology, and that was way back in the 60s. <clears throat> and they were talking about America as the most anxious uh, world power in the world. We're, we're a people of anxiety, and it was going to cause in the 60s, if we don't learn to how to deal with stress and anxiety, we're going to become a very sick nation. That was my psychology teachers warning us in the 60s. Now, let me tell you, the Bible has a solution for it. It doesn't deal with pills. It doesn't deal with long hours of deep theology uh, or, or counseling. But it does have an answer to it. And listen, let me tell you, here's the pill you need to take. The peace, the peace of God. And I'm going to show you that today. We're going to crank this down and and get into it. I've got two hours to do it. I hope I can make it. So let's start with a word of prayer and we'll get after this. I gave you a moment of silence as a believer priest. 
Why? Because the Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. You can't live it, nor can you learn it. In carnality, the evidence of carnality in 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 3, the evidence of carnality is personal sin. It could be mental attitude sin, sins of the tongue, or overt sins. You should confess them in silence and privacy, according to 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. <laughs> Go ahead and make that, take that responsibility of your own priesthood. Well, Father, how thankful we are to be back <clears throat> at Doctrinal Studies Bible Church to speak the truth as we understand it out of the pages of the Word of God. What we know about this subject, Father, we have studied from the Word of God, not from other manuscripts, <clears throat> not for other books. We have dug it out. And what a phenomenal study it is, peace with God that becomes the peace of God. And there's a sharp difference in those two ideas. <clears throat> the little preposition with and the little preposition of. <clears throat> and so I pray, Father, you would help us understand the difference in them because the difference between an unbeliever and a believer <clears throat> and the subject of peace, the peace of God. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the text I'm going to look at and you can open your Bible to it now if you would like to. We're not going to read it right now because I'm going to study it in detail in a moment. But it's Ephesians, <clears throat> Ephesians, the second chapter, <clears throat> which is the great chapter on salvation, if you remember. Uh, it is out of the second chapter that we get, for by grace are you saved through faith and not of yourself as gift of God, not of works like any man should boast. <clears throat> the in fact, the first 17 verses of Ephesians 2 is all about bringing the, uh, get, it's the theology of, of conversion, what it means to be saved. Then verses 18 through 22 uh, speaks to believers. What I'm interested in is the subject of peace. I picked this subject up in verse 11 through 22 <clears throat> where he talks about the different concepts of peace. There's a peace with God. And there's the peace of God, and they're different. The mechanics, the mechanics is different. <clears throat> the mechanics is different. And what you need to know that you're not going to get the peace of God until you get peace with God. I'm going to say that again. <clears throat> you, what you need to understand as a Christian, you're not going to get the peace of God as a person. You're not going to get the peace of God <clears throat> in your life until you become at peace with God. And this is where a lot, of, a lot of Christians don't get this. And so our subject today is going to deal with that. And one of the reasons I'm doing this, I'm interested in the Eucharist cup. We have now studied, there are nine factors of communion of the theology of the blood of Christ connect with the Eucharist cup. We have studied reconciliation. Uh, we have studied redemption, propitiation, justification, purification, and forgiveness of sins. Today, we're going to talk about the peace with God <clears throat> for salvation and the peace of, of God for the believer's life. And these are different. <clears throat> and you need to understand. Peace with God is for the unbeliever. The peace of God, the peace of God is for the believer how he deals with his Christian life. <clears throat> and so we're at the seventh of the nine uh, doctrines of the theology of the blood of Christ in connection with the Eucharist cup. <clears throat> we'll look at four ideas. These four ideas will cover these two subjects, peace with God and the peace of God. <clears throat> point number one, I establish this principle in point one <clears throat> by examining uh, uh, by examining our lesson text, which is Ephesians 2, 1 through 17, the unbeliever, verses 18 through 22, the believer. <clears throat> so one of the things I want to do is I want to, I, I want to just flash through here quickly with you because I'm going to come back to it. <clears throat> Notice in verse 13, he talks about 
Therefore, remember that formerly you were Gentiles. And verse 12, remember that at that time when you were an unbeliever, you were separated from God, excluded, etc. But look, verse 13. But now in Christ Jesus, that's a positional phrase. That's positional truth. Now in Christ Jesus. What has gotten you from a formally into now, now in Christ Jesus, is that you believe that Christ died for your sins, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, was buried and raised from the dead. That's called the gospel, and you have believed it, and the gospel is the power of God to save those who believe, Romans 1, 16, so that for by grace are ye saved through faith and not of yourself. It is a gift of God, not of works, least any man shall boast, Ephesians 2, 8, 9. <clears throat> okay? So in this first part of this, verses 11, he talks about, he says, now in Christ Jesus, you who were formerly far off are now brought near by the blood of Christ. Look at verse 14. For he alone, when it says he himself, it means no one else. When it says he himself, you know, you hear from little kids, I do it myself. I've been with those little kids this way, so I know about this. I've become an expert in that idea. He himself, or he alone, is our peace, who, 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 bought both, who made both groups into one, broke down the barrier, which is Adam's sin, of the dividing wall. By abolishing his flesh, he goes through that. And then he comes down to verse and, and establishing, and by establishing peace, in verse 16, might reconcile them both to God through the cross, put to death the enmity. And then he quotes Isaiah 57, 19. He came and preached peace to those who were far off and those who were near. Look, at the far off are the unbelievers in passage here, Gentiles, and those who are near are believers, Jews, who had in, should have been easier. Look, they should have been easier. Jesus said in John 1, 11 through 13, I came to my, John says, Christ came to, came to his own, and his own received him not. But to as many as did receive him, to those he gave the rights to become children of God. That's what we're talking about. <laughs> the Everybody is far off as far as salvation, whether you're Jew or Gentile. you got to be saved the same way. No man comes to the Father <laughs> except through Christ. I don't care if you're Jew, born Jew or not. But the Jew born Jew and had the scriptures and had all the stuff were nearer than those, the Gentiles, who were far off. Now everybody's far off, and everybody can brought, be brought near only by the blood of Christ. You can't be brought near to God apart from the blood of Christ. But even if you're far off, you can be brought near. I don't care how bad off you are. I don't care where you think you are. You think, oh, my life, I could never be saved. Oh, I've done such bad things in my life, I could never be saved. That's not true. That's not true. If you got breath, if you have breath of life still in you, you can be saved. You're far off. It don't matter how far off you are. You can be brought near through the blood of Jesus Christ. That's the point Paul is making. And that's how you get to the peace with God. You can't have peace with God. You're at enmity. And enmity, separation from God, excluded, without hope, without God in the world. He's going to go on to tell you. And so what has to be done, look, it had to be, the gospel of Christ had to be preached to the Gentile far away and had to be preached to the Jew near that both of them had to be saved by the work of Christ on the cross, his burial resurrection called the gospel in order to be saved. And it, if you are, then both of you get the same thing. You get a gift. It's called peace with God. If you're far off and you believe the gospel, you get peace with God. If you're near and believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, 
you, you get peace with God. Whether you're far off or near, it doesn't. Listen, the distance is not the point. The separation, the point is, how do I get to God only through Jesus Christ, through his death, burial, and resurrection? That's called the gospel. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, Romans 1.16. And so this is how that whole subject goes. And then verse 18, 19, and 20, he's talking to believers. Well, well, look, he said, for through him we have access in one spirit to the Father. We are no longer strangers and aliens. We are fellow citizens and saints of the household of God. We're built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Christ being the cornerstone in whose building, being fitted together, growing into the holy temple in the Lord, in whom we are built together into a dwelling of God in the Holy Spirit. You see? That's who you are in Christ. All 17, all 17 verses are to tell you, you got to get saved. Man, you've got to believe. And the moment you believe, I don't care if you're far off or near. I don't care if you never went to church or you go to church. Listen, the question is, do you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ? Do you believe he died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead? If you do, I don't care if you're far away or near, you can get saved. And you can't get saved any other way. There is no other. There is no other system. There is no other way. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one. <laughs> John 14, 6. No one. I don't care if you're the Pope. No one. I don't care if you're near. No one. I don't care if you're far away. The atheist stuck into his, put his head in the sand someplace. I don't care. Listen, no one. No one. <laughs> so, in Ephesians 2, actually 1 through 17, but my text is 11 through 17, deals with the unbeliever. 18 through 22 deals with the believer. So, you see, in my text, the first part deals with God's peace, deals with the unbeliever. It's called peace with God, making peace with God. Can't do it on your own. Well, I think I'll go to church and I'll be okay. <laughs> no, you're just near. You're not in. <laughs> just because you go to church don't get you saved, Bubba. I can call you Bubba, can't I? I'm in the South. I can call you Bubba. You can get saved. I often say you can't get saved by going to church. You get saved by believing the gospel of Jesus Christ. You can't, you can't get any more. You become a car because you sleep in the garage. You sleep in the garage don't make you a car. Come on. So, peace with God. Here's Ephesians 2.17. He came, he preached peace to you who were far away, Gentiles, and peace to those who were near Jews. I don't care if you're far away as a Gentile or really near as a Jew. Nicodemus! Nicodemus! You being the teacher of the Bible, don't you know that you have to be born again? Nicodemus! For God so loved the world, Nicodemus, that he sent his only begotten son into the world, Nicodemus, so that you could believe and no longer perish but have eternal life. Nicodemus, don't you know that? Nicodemus was pretty near and still far away. Nicodemus. Nicodemus. Don't you know that being religious don't get you saved? Nicodemus, Nicodemus. Don't you know that God sent his only begotten son into the world to save you, Nicodemus? Nicodemus, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one can come to the Father. Nicodemus, don't you know that? You do now. Nicodemus, you know it now. Buddy, you may have not come with this in your heart, but I'll tell you, you'll leave here with it in your heart. 
because John 16 says that when it's presented, the Holy Spirit will convict of sin, of righteousness, and judgment. And buddy, I know that personal firsthand. Because he got me with it. He came and preached to you. Here it is in Romans 5.1. And having been justified. I want to show you something. Look at the word justified. The, it's got an A, a P, and a PT. C. That's aorist, passive, participle in the Greek language. But let me tell you what it really says. Having been justified. Aorist tense is the moment you believe the gospel. The moment you believe the gospel. That's the aorist tense. A point in time, divorce from time. That's the Greek language. A point in time, divorce from time that deals with past history at some point. And so at some point, you believe that Jesus came into the world, died on the cross for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead to the third day. At that point, that which happened 2,000 years ago is going to work to your advantage at this point in time. For me, I was 23 years old. And I believe that somebody who died 2,000 years ago was still alive and had my best interest in his heart. Now, I'll tell you, that was a stretch for me. But I'll tell you what got me. Not that he died on a cross. He was raised on the third day as predicted, as he predicted. <laughs> what could I do with that? I saw three guys hung on a cross the same day on the same hill at the same time. state crimes, all committed, all guilty by law of committing state crimes. I'll tell you what got me. It wasn't the three died. What got me is the one who came out three days later predicted. <laughs> what am I going to do with that? Witness after witness called before us, firsthand witnesses the end of the book of Matthew, the end of the book of Luke, the end of the book of Mark, the end of the book of John, and the beginning of the book of Acts give you witness after witness after witness. Even the graves were open, and followers of Christ were raised from the dead and went into the city and witnessed for Jesus Christ. Think about that. That's what got me. And that's what got me at 23 years of age. I couldn't argue that away. There was no logical sense. I could not argue that away. I could either accept it or reject it. I didn't like the odds if I rejected it. I didn't like the idea of going to hell. And by the way, the year before I got saved, or the year I got saved, I had three of my best friends killed at, in a boat accident. So the reality of death for a young person was really in my soul. <clears throat> you, need to, you need to realize these things. What are you doing with your life? Who are you listening to? I give you scripture to tell you. Listen to this. Having been justified, aorist tense at a point in time that you believe, pass a voice, you're saved by grace. The moment you believe, for by grace are you saved through faith, believing, faith, and not of yourself, is get, not of any works, well, Rod, I'm going to change my life, and when I get my life changed, get cleaned up, then I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to accept Christ as my Savior. You'll never make it. 
That's not how you get saved. You get saved just as you are, without one plea, but that Christ died for me. That's how you get saved. You sit around and wait till you get right. You'll die wrong. You'll die wrong. And so, the participle is the doctrinal principle I explained. Having been justified by faith, act plus the ablative of source, the source of separation. What am I separated from? The 13 judicial charges of Adam's sin, like enmity and alienation and wrath and condemnation. We have peace with God. Do you see that? You ought to circle that. You know who gets peace with God? The person that gets justified by the gospel through faith. That's who gets it. Do you know what's interesting about that? That's pros plus the accusative. That's pros plus the accusative. The word with, that's pros plus the accusative. That's an accusative, accusative case of Irene. Peace with God. Notice that the word pawn, a definite article with theos, God, is an accusative singular masculine. And notice I got dia plus the ablative. Dia plus the ablative translated in English through. Now listen to what he says. Having been justified by faith, i.e. through the gospel, we have peace with God. That's in association with God. No man can come to the Father except through Christ. And when you come through Christ, you are associated now with God, who is now your daddy father. Romans 8 chapter. Watch this. Peace with God through dia plus the ablative of agent of peace with God, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, referring to his resurrection, Jesus, his humanity, he came to to save his people from their sin, Christ the Messiah, the Messiah of the old covenant to come to fulfill and establish a new covenant. All of that now. <laughs> That's Romans 5, 1. It's called the theology of the blood of Christ. When you look at Romans, the, the whole chapter of Romans, the fifth chapter, is devoted to that subject. But when you look at verse 9, 16, and 18, you will see some wonderful things discussed there about justification. Now, we've already studied, studied, studied justification. We're no longer talking about justification. We're talking about peace. But you got to be justified to get peace. It's all part of a big package. Of 50 things you receive at salvation, you can never lose in time and eternity. There are so many ways to tell somebody they need to be saved. You can do it from the English. You can do it from the Greek. When you put them all together, you're overwhelmed with the evidence. You, how could you not understand this? Now, the second part of our lesson text, Ephesians 2, 18 through 22, deals with a believer. It deals with a believer. We call that the peace of God. You can't have the peace of God until you get peace with God. You've got to be, you've got to be reconciled. You have to be reconciled with God as an unbeliever. You have to be reconciled. You have, to be, you have to come to peace with God in order to have the peace of God. There's a difference. Do you not, do you not hear the difference? Here it is, Philippians 4, 7 for the believer. Hey, I want you to look that. Would you, there's a Bible in front of you. You didn't bring one or if you got a phone, however you, however you do this stuff. Let's slide over to he. I want to show you something. I want to look verse 7 first. Because I want to introduce you to the peace of God. Philippians. Let's see. 
at, on page 11, 1139 in my Bible, of course, yours would be different, I suppose. I don't know. Listen to if, uh, Philippians. Did I say Philippians? I mean, if I didn't, I'm at, I'm at Philippians. I, I said Ephesians, didn't I? I? I'm at Philippians. Did I say Ephesians? How come you don't know what I'm thinking? It's good you don't. <laughs> Philippians 4, 7. I'm sorry. Philippians 4, 7. Are you with me? Now, a lot of you are going to know this and not believe it. You're going to know it, but you don't believe it. Oh, listen to me now. A lot of you know this verse. And don't believe it for application. Watch this. Verse 7. And the peace of God, we're talking to Christians. See, if you have peace with God, you have the opportunity to have the peace of God. Now, you're only going to have peace with God because it's based on the work of Christ, not on yours. The peace with God will never be taken from you in time and eternity. None. Once you got it, you got it. Now, the peace of God's a different deal. Now, watch this. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension. Isn't that an interesting idea? <laughs> I mean, it almost sounds like you have to be brain dead. When something can surpass all comprehension, it sounds like brain dead. <laughs> You're not getting it, so I'm going to repeat it one more time. We're told which, the peace of God, which surpasses, not some, all comprehension. <laughs> Are you getting that in your head? I mean, that's, such, that's so way out there. <laughs> Does that not stagger your imagination what that could mean? Surpasses? See, look, look, surpasses. <laughs> All comprehension. The peace of God, which the peace of God, which passes all comprehension. Well, what will that do for me, Pastor? What will that do for me, Pastor? What will that do for me? Oh, watch. I'm going to give you a gift. Watch this gift. I'm bringing a gift to you. When it can pass, when the peace of God can pass all your comprehension, I'd rather have peace of God than, than silver or gold or whatever can pass your comprehension. Get your comprehension out of the way. Let it go by. The peace of God, speeding right past all your comprehension. Oh, let me figure this out. Oh, let me figure it 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 out. Oh, by you. Who does that? You do that. When the peace of God passes all your comprehension, then here's a promise to you from God Almighty today. <laughs> shall guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Promise of God. I'd rather have the peace of God than anything my mind can conjure up. <laughs> because when you get that by it, when the peace of God gets out and runs all the way down through your life 
and you're not trying to figure it out and do this and do that, do this, then it'll start to work on your behalf. It will guard your heart your belief system. It will guard your mind. The way you think and the way you react and the way you respond to the things your mind gets all comprehensive about. Oh! Are you listening to me? I'm going through a lot of work. Because you're not getting it. You are not getting this verse. Because you let it stop at this train station and sit down and eat and drink and all that kind of craziness and go murder to the fruitcake. You don't let the peace of God surpass your comprehension. For when it does, it will guard your heart your mind. That's the stuff of comprehension that makes you nuttier than a fruitcake. Now look at verse 6. <laughs> Look at verse 6. There's your bugger boo. You know what a bugger boo is? I don't know. I just know how to use it. I hope it's not a bad thing. Look right here. This is what gets your panties in a wide. Deanna, that's what Deanna says. That's her favorite line to me. Look at this. Be anxious for nothing. <laughs> oh, you're saying to me, Pastor, that's impossible. Oh, oh, Pastor, 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 Pastor. You need to walk in my shoes. I have a hard time walking on my own. What do you, why do you need yours? Yeah, listen, we all have our own shoes to walk in. I don't need to walk in yours. You don't need to walk in mine, but we do need to walk on our own. <laughs> How about that? I I'll agree to that. Be anxious for what? Huh? Come on, congregation. Be anxious for what? Huh? <laughs> it, it, look, you're through. You're through now, aren't you? Because it's those things that you're anxious about that's got you all torn up, that's called comprehending, that stops the peace of God from going right through it, right into your heart and right into your soul and mind. Oh, pastor, you've got to be crazy. Be anxious for nothing. What is the antidote for anxiety? Peace with God, the peace of God, the peace of God, the peace of God, the peace of God is the antidote for all of this anxiety in the church of Jesus Christ. Well, Pastor, you're asking me to do something that's impossible. Oh, no, it isn't. And if you'll stay with me the next hour, I'll prove to you how you can do it by grace and not of yourself. <laughs> no, don't go home. We're just getting wound up. Don't go home. I don't care where you think you ought to be. You are. You ought to be is where you are. That's where you ought to be. You ought to be is where you are. Don't you go home second hour. That's going home without the medicine. Don't do that. You cheat yourself. Because you're told to be anxious for nothing. And the antidote is peace of God. You're told to be anxious for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and by supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be known to God, and the peace of God will do what? 
See, you miss this. You skip the most important part of that verse, which surpasses all comprehension. You're to be anxious about what? And if you will do that, you will allow the peace of God to roll through your life and change it in the most dramatic ways. Because it will come through and it will guard your heart and protect your mind where all this craziness is going on, all this comprehension is going on, and the peace of God will enter and will cause you to find rest for your soul. And I'm going to tell you how to do it, second hour. I'm going to tell you how to do it, second hour. Let us pray, and then I'll take the offer, and we'll take a break. I need it. This break is for me. <laughs> I get calmed down a moment. There'll be some sugar and caffeine for you to make the second hour, so you'll be all right. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you that your grace has provided everything in the first meal to establish how we're going to be this person, be anxious for nothing. But to be able to go through prayer that introduces us, Father, to the work of the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension and will guard and protect us in the way we think and behave. The peace of God. We're thankful for the reports we heard today, Father, of a, of a loving, caring, nurturing church that sends missionaries with the gospel of Christ. We pray for Josh. We pray for Rick as he prepares. We pray for our missionaries on the front, boots on the front, front line. We lift Horton before you today, Steve Chafin. We lift before you, Father, today, Deborah Smith. We pray for healing upon their lives, healing, Father. Bring quality of life back into their souls. Bring quality of life back into their bodies of, of function. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. But I want to get to mechanics on the peace of God. Now, remember, the peace with God is a salvation deal. And when you get it, it's for time and eternity. That never changes, that you have peace with God in Christ. Uh, that's, that's a done deal. Okay? Now, the peace of God is what you get as a believer what you should, what you should, the mechanics, you need to know how to get the peace of God, not peace with God, how to get the peace of God into your life operative. How does it work? How? Be anxious for nothing, but by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Right? I mean, then he says, the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your, your heart and your mind. Now, look, that's an absolute promise. That, there's no if and buts about it. Now, I can't give you the assurance of it, but I can give you the doctrine of it. You need to understand the assurance of it. So I need to break this down. How do you... How do you have this peace of God in your life that can deal with the anxiety levels that you have in order... See, the anxiety stuff is, 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 going, to, is going to cause this peace of God not to function. Anxiety is a mental attitude sin. And there may be... There may be uh, the, the, several causes connected with it, hormonal and a lot of things, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter what is producing anxiety, and some of it could be chemical. You could address that. 
Some of it could be chemical, but it's when it becomes mental that I'm concerned with. Once it becomes a mental issue, because the peace of God deals with anxiety, right? Be anxious for nothing. Tells you to, to increase your prayer life. Because, listen, anxiety is about things in our life that we're, we're struggling with. Anxiety. Listen, th th there's nothing wrong with stress, but there is with anxiety. Stress is a normal part of life. Y you need to have the attitude about it like you do when you go to the gym. When I went to the gym, it was all about stress. And they said, this is good for you. It will build muscle. You put stress on your body, on your muscles, in your legs, and, and whatever. And it builds, it builds you. It, it's, there's a building program in it. Now, you can go too far with it, of course, and it can break down and do different things. But with anxiety, say, it's not about stress. Anxiety has carried you beyond stress. Stress is a normal way of life. You can't live without stress. If you have a job at 8 o'clock in the morning, you know what I'm talking about. Unless you're smart enough like my, like Rick Owens who could walk if he wanted to. Let the traffic come and go out there and get hit by a car crossing the road. Got his office near enough that he could walk if he wanted to. But now, so what I want to do is... <clears throat> While the message for the unbeliever is peace with God, far off, brought near, what we're interested is the brought near part, brought into a place that once you have peace with God, you'll always have that. I'm not talking about that. That's a salvation issue that takes care of the 13 judicial charges of Adam's sin against you. I'm talking about the everyday Christian life in the devil's world. 1 John 5, 19, you know there's the devil's world, don't you? <laughs> this is his playground. This is his playground. So, what he tries to do is take stress to anxiety. Take stress to distress to depression. Stress takes it to distress, takes it to depression. That's his ballgame. Now, on the other side of it, you got stress, and you move it to the peace of God. Stress, you move to the peace of God. Stress, you move, you don't let stress become distress, because distress is anxiety. So, when you get into stress, just move, move it immediately. What do he tell you to do? When you get into anxiety, when you get into distress, when stress becomes distress and you become anxious, what did he tell you to do? Ephesians 4, 6 told you to do something. Told you to pray. Go to prayer and connect with the peace of God. Go to prayer and connect with the peace of God. But it is the peace of God. Now, prayer, it is a, prayer takes you to the peace of God. The peace of God is what surpasses all comprehensions and guards. It is the peace of God that guards your heart and your soul, your, your mind. Do you understand that? I know it would be easier to just take a pill, but I'm just telling you how it works. I can't give you a pill. All I can say is you are one. Okay. Now, let me tell you, there are two ways you're going to deal with this. And there's mechanics. One, you've got to be spiritual. And two, you've got to work the faith rest system. The faith cycle. You got to work the faith cycle. You do these two things, you're home free. It is the peace of God that surpasses all comprehension and will guard your belief system and your mind system, your heart system and your mind system. How you function, what you believe, heart system, mind system, how you perceive things, how you deal with things. 
Because that's the stuff that builds, builds, takes stress into distress that takes into depression. All right, so let's talk about it. There are two ways. There are two, there are two things, and here they are. Spirituality. 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 See the word spirit? Spirituality. See the word spirit? That's the indwelling Holy Spirit in your life in the new covenant. This is really important. And here's the verse. Here's, here's the big verse. Galatians 5, 16, 17. Galatians 5, 16. Walk by means of the indwelling Holy Spirit. And here's the promise. You will not carry out or fulfill the desires of the flesh. Because that's the way the devil gets into the system and throws monkey wrenches in it. The flesh. The flesh identifies with the world. The spirit identifies with God. The Holy Spirit's God. God. The flesh is earthly at best and worldly at worst. Flesh is earthly. Comes, your flesh comes from the dust you come and from the dust you return. Come on. That's one part of the flesh. The other part of the flesh is the, how it operates, the old sin nature in man. So he says, walk in the spirit. You will not fulfill. Here's what, here's what gets you stress. That's okay. Stay spirit-filled. Go to prayer. When it gets to you, go to prayer. Go to the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Don't go to the flesh. Inner dialogue. Inner dialogue. When you start talking to yourself about the stress, you're going to go to distress. That's how it works. The way to solve it is to go through prayer to the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Don't go to the flesh. Go to the Spirit. Go to prayer. Go to the Holy Spirit. Go to the Holy Spirit. See, the Holy... Listen, 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. What? Don't you know that the Holy Spirit dwells inside your body? Point of salvation. Galatians 3, 2. He dwells inside your body. And your body is not your own. It's been bought by God through Christ at Calvary, death, burial, resurrection. And you are not your own. You are not your own. Therefore, don't become your own. When you get into stress, don't become your own. Don't, don't allow it to go to distress. Don't do that. Because God has put the Holy Spirit in you, bought you, you're not your own. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, you should read it. You are not your own. And that's a good thing. That's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. And God has given you the Holy Spirit so that you don't have to be on your own. Naomi, Naomi went to a place she shouldn't went. She went out full, in her words, went to a place she shouldn't have went. She lost her husband and allowed stress to go to distress and depression. Then she lost her oldest son. She went into, before she could recover from the one, she was into another because she was in a bad place in her soul, not just a bad place in her body, but a bad place in her soul. And then her second son died. She kept digging the hole deeper. She was now into depression. Where do you, listen, where do you think you go after depression? Today, you go to a mental institution. 
in that day, you just cover, you just stayed in bed and covered up your head and never came out. Then she was forced, in her mind, forced to sell her property in the promised land. And when she went through all of that, do you see the whole, it just piles, started piling up. She just kept sinking deeper into depression. So that when she finally went back home, she was very bitter. Didn't have to do any of that. Listen, there are a lot of Naomi's today who call themselves bitter in the church. Listen, God didn't save you to make you bitter. He saved you to make you better. When you run your own deal, when you run your own program, when you run your own life, it's my life. I'll do with it what I want to do with it, and I don't care. You're in trouble. Because you cut off your life support system. And so, we got Galatians 5, 16, 17. Walk in the Spirit. Walk. That's in every area of your life. You don't have to have one area stressful and four others that aren't. Because eventually you get to all of them. <laughs> There's one thing about distress, anxiety. If it, you know, it'll soon absorb and Swallow all, all of your life up, just a matter of time, unless you know how to break it. Break the cycle. It can be broken. It can, broke, it can be broken in a, in a split second of time, just like salvation. In a split, a split second of time. It may take you 10 years to dig a hole that buries you, and you can come out of it just like that. Just like in salvation, you can live in sin, live in sin, live in sin, live in sin, and you can be saved out of an heartbeat, Right? Come on, come on. This is the way God works. It works in salvation. It works in spirituality. It works in faith. It works the same way. This is not a pro. Listen, the prodigal son, it took him a long time to get out. It took him a long time to get into his mess. It took him no time to get out. All he had to do is come to his senses and walk away. Now, I want you to look at this thing. I want you to look at this thing. When you find yourself in distress, when you find yourself in anxiety, you got you to gotta confess your sin. You, you got to confess your sin because anxiety is a sin. It's like any other sin. You got to confess it. First John 1 9. And what will he do? He'll, he'll, he'll cleanse you and restore you to fellowship with God. And what does it do? What does confession of sin do? It brings you back into spirituality. It brings you back into the function. Listen. Sin is walking in the flesh. The evidence of carnality is personal sin. The evidence of flesh, flesh is personal sin. Carnality. Carnality is walking in the flesh. It's sarkikos. Sark is the word flesh. Sarkikos is be, meaning that you're developing a lifestyle this way. You're not walking in the spirit. You're walking in the flesh. And your flesh will get you nowhere with God. Flesh will get you nowhere with God. It will get you in the world and it will get you deep. And so you need to understand that. Now, I want, you to, I, want you to, I want you to put your eyes on a couple of things, would you? Go to John with me. Go to John. I want you to see some things about walking in the Spirit and how this peace of God works for you. Uh, I want you to go to John 14. When Jesus is talking about when the Holy Spirit comes, what he will do in the life of a believer, what is his responsibility? I just want to pick up a couple things uh, dealing with this one subject matter. I wrote this on your paper, John 14, 26, the helper or the comforter, the helper or the comforter, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, you don't get the Holy Spirit any other way than in the name of Jesus, and you get it at the point of salvation, Galatians 3, 2. The Father will send in my name. Watch this. He will teach you all things. What's it? That's what he's doing now. 
He will teach you all things, watch this, and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Teach and recall. The Holy Spirit's job inside you is to teach and recall. To teach you what's going on, to have you recall pertinent doctrines to apply. It's his job. He lives in there. His job is to teach you. His job is to recall what is necessary for you in your life. Why is it important to walk in the Spirit? That's one reason. That's a big one. That's one. Look in the 16th chapter with me for a moment. Now, there's a lot of information in here, 14, 15, and 16. But watch this one. I'm in the 16th chapter. I'm looking at verse 13. When he comes back to this subject again, and when he, the spirit of truth, he's got a nomenclature attached to his name. Now, he's the Holy Spirit. But he's a spirit of truth, right? He teaches and recall. And, and so here we have, here is the spirit of truth. Maybe he's there to teach and recall and develop a system of truth in your life. Because it is the truth that sets you free from the cosmic system of anxiety. You know? John, John uh, 8.32. And he, the, the spirit of truth, when he comes. Well, how did, when does he come to your life? Now, he's talking when he comes. But how does he come to your life? When you believe. He takes up residence in your body. He never leaves. When he comes, watch this now. He will guide you. Think about that. A GPR living in you. GPR? GPS. I don't know. I just went to a store, I think. He will guide you. He will guide you. Thank God you know how to interpret me. You're a wonderful congregation. You know how to interpret me. He will guide you. Now watch this. He will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own initiative. Think about that. You would think he would, could do that. But he can't. He can only guide you into truth. And he can't speak his opinion about it. He can only speak the opinion of what God has told you is true. He can guide you in it, but he can't help you with it. Do you understand what I mean? He can't. You've got to, you've got to believe it, and he can't, he can't support it any other way other than to guide you in making the right decision and thinking the right way. Isn't that, isn't that interesting? Why? Volition. Volition is the target of the angelic conflict. Volition. You, even Jesus, had to voluntarily give himself to the cross. No man takes my life. I give it to God. He will not speak on his own initiative, but whatever he hears... God say in his ear, he speaks to yours. For he shall take of my, oh, what? He will speak. Watch this now. Here's the second thing, really important, <clears throat> that he can do. He will disclose to you what is to come. Think about that. In regard to truth. Now pay attention to the word disclose. Watch this word. He shall glorify me, and he shall take of mine, and shall disclose it to you. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore I said that he takes of mine, and will disclose it to you. Three times he's used that word. That's a marker. <clears throat> oh, dear people. Do not ignore the enormous ministry of the Holy Spirit in your life. 
in regard to what you believe and how you behave. He is your advocate of life. Now, let's go to Galatians. Back to Galatians 3. I don't know if you were there. I quoted it. Uh, 5, uh, Galatians 5. I quoted 16. Walk in the Spirit. Look down to verse 22. Look down to verse 22. Now, you know this. Everybody in this congregation, <clears throat> the fruit of the Spirit, notice that singular. And it's where the word is. So you look at each one of these individually. The fruit of the Spirit is love. As if there was not other. The fruit of the Spirit is joy. As if there was not other. The fruit of the Spirit is peace. That's what I'm after. Third in line. Fruit of the Spirit. Now, now, are you with me? If you're not, you're in deep trouble. I'm serious. If you don't get this, this is basic stuff. Watch this. F fruit of the Spirit is peace, right? Here's what we can do. We can take the word peace and put it in the place of the word fruit. Can we? Please tell me you can do that. <laughs> I don't know if I have to work hard for you or for me. The fruit of the Spirit is peace. Therefore, I can put the word peace in the place of fruit. Would you agree? I could do that. I'm the teacher. Now, listen how, listen what he's telling you. The peace of what? The peace of the Holy Spirit. P-E-A-C-E. -E. You know what that peace is? That's the peace of God because the Holy Spirit is God the third person. Agreed? Well, I don't, I'm not really asking for consent on that. I'm just making a statement. Actually, I was making a statement. <laughs> yeah, I was just making a statement. Hey, did uh, do you have a, a report on Deborah's surgery from yesterday? Great. Absolutely. That's wonderful. Thank you, Jesus. Absolutely. Well, well, we'll take two at a time. Come on. Two at a time. We'll get there. Two at a time. Well, yes. I mean, if you know Boyce, you know what kind of shape he's in right now. But listen, he'll be, he'll be all right. I know. He'll be all right. Boyce has got the doctrine to be all right. Now, look, if you have the peace of God, the peace of God will surpass all comprehension. So don't get, don't get yourself all, all messed up in your head. Keep your heart pure with the Lord. Keep the word of God prevalent. And whatever that stress is over, find the categorical doctor. But in the meantime, in the meantime, go to prayer. Go to the ministry of the Holy Spirit because he has, God has promised that he has to give you peace. The peace of God comes through the Holy Spirit. The peace of God, not peace with God, the peace of God. The peace with God comes through the blood. The peace of God comes through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Please tell me you know that.
I mean, there's how you have victory. There's how you have victory right there. And you hold to that. You hold to that. And I tell you, that is it right there. The second thing, and I'm, I'm running out of time, so listen to me. The second thing is faith. 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says, walk by faith, not by Walk by faith. Now, we're talking about the faith cycle. Faith comes by hearing, believing, applying, and completing the faith cycle. you got to understand the faith cycle. Because if you walk by faith, you won't get all of this. See, sight is all the mess. See, that's what happened to Naomi. She got her, she got her, she got hooked on sight. Every, everything had to, be, had, to, had to be this way, this way, this way. Then she started losing all that, all those details of life. She started losing them. She lost her grip on life. What she was holding on, she thought that was her life. But listen, your life is God. Your life is God. It's not what you hold to. It's not what you have when you go home. It's what you have wherever you are. It's not your possessions. It's not your stuff. Not even your help. All of these things you will learn are gifts. And they come from an awesome, mighty God. We should be thankful for them. Here's, here's my Bible. Word. Now, you know 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17. Listen, you got to inhale and exhale the word of God. Faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God. You got to inhale and exhale. All Scripture is God-breathed, 2 Corinthians, uh, 2 Timothy 3.16. All Scripture, not some Scripture, all Scripture is God-breathed. This is where faith is developed. You inhale and exhale. You learn it, you take it in, you believe it, and then you exhale it, you apply it to your life. You need to study categorical Bible doctrine. That's how you live. That's how you eat is categorically. I'll take a little mashed potatoes, a little gravy, a little meat, a little this, a little that. What you got? I got a plate full of categories of food. Just the way you live. It's a, it's a way you live for God, by the way. Now, look, I'm going to give you one verse, then we're going to go home. I, I'll try to make this quick. I got three minutes. If that clock is right. Okay, the clock's it. They, the, Railroad clock says yes. Watch this. Let the peace of Christ. Now watch this. Watch this. I've heard about the peace of God. I've heard about the peace of the Spirit. And now I've heard about the peace of Christ. All three members of the Godhead are all over this idea of peace. The inner peace that comes to your life that separates you from the way the world thinks and behaves and believes. Are you with me? Now, if you go to the world for these solutions, they're going to give you worldly solutions. If you go there and they're talking about physical conditions, we're okay. Because it could be hormonal, it could be a lot of things. When we're talking about how the mind is, what the, where the mind is focused, how the mind is thinking, what the heart is believing, and what the mind is thinking, what the heart is believing, and the mind is thinking, what the heart is believing, and the mind is thinking, we need the peace of God. You understand what I'm saying? I'm not talking about something biological. I'm talking about something spiritual in your life. Let the peace of Christ, watch this now. Let the peace of Christ, this volitional, the word let means volitional, right? Let it. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts to which indeed you were called in one body and be thankful, period. Watch this. Let the word of Christ 
Guess where the peace of Christ comes from? <laughs> Let the word of Christ richly dwell in you. Richly. That's more than you spend in a day. In fact, richly, listen, might be more than you could spend in a lifetime. Depends on who the big guy behind it is. Guess what? Who's behind this one? Richly is God Almighty. Let the word of Christ dwell, richly dwell in you with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another. Here we go, Rick. With psalms, hymns, spiritual songs. My music man. Singing, singing with thankfulness in your hearts. And I tell you, we do that well here. We do it well. We do it well. That's why people sing right out around here. And why Richard leads us in great congregational singing. So, I've given you mechanics. Now you got to take your medicine. <laughs> you got to put this, you got to study this stuff. You got to put it in application. I promise you, anxiety is gone. As long as you do it God's way. Gone. Not going to let it get there. Not never going to let stress get to distress. It's a choice. It's a choice. It's a choice. It does not have to be. You have the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit. You have the richness, the richness of the word of Christ. It's sufficient. Faith is the victory. Faith is the victory that overcomes the world. First John 5, 4. Faith. It is the victory. Oh, dear people. Your life can be set free from so much of this cosmic system if you would just do the things that are grace given to you. If you would just assimilate the grace things that God has given you to deal with your life. Our Father, we're thankful today for these who have come our way by automobile and by internet to visit with us on the subject of peace. The peace with God that becomes the peace of God. I pray, Father, the Holy Spirit would minister the truth as he, is, as he says he will. He will teach and recall. He will guide and he will disclose. <laughs> oh, I love that, Father. I just love that. I thank you for a marvelous plan and a program. You've not left us, Father, without adequate tools to live the dynamics of the Christian life and be a spokesperson on behalf of your grace. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.